Hello and welcome to what will probably be a very abridged Stellaris campaign commentary. In this one we're playing as the peacocks for no particular reason, more importantly I've set up our race to have some specific traits and civics to help us out with getting more immigration which we'll need as we'll see, so we're xenophilic and we're a free haven and some other stuff that we don't necessarily need and this is because we are going to do for this campaign the quote unquote challenge of using the birch world and the birch world only. What I wanted to do is a challenge run where I don't make anything other than my home planet, but I realized that might be too difficult because there's not very much you can do with the planet. But with a birch world, you can do quite a lot. So this is mainly aiming to not have to do loads of micro and make the game less annoying. We'll see how it goes and I'll explain it a bit more in a second. For now, we're looking at the gigastructural engineering thing. This is the main mod I am using. And one aspect of the mod is that we can enable a special endgame crisis and enable the ability for three other endgame crises to spawn at the same time. So the goal of this campaign is to not die when that happens. We need to prepare for the upcoming end of the universe where several bad things will all happen at once. However, in gigastructural engineering, you can normally build attack moons and behemoth planet craft, which can easily destroy the crisis factions. So we're going to be disabling those. We'll still have plenty of overpowered things we can build in terms of getting resources and research, but we won't be able to just simply outgun the enemy, which is what I did the last time I played Stellaris with this mod. So here's our setup in the middle of the galaxy. The Birch World is at the core, and the core systems are not connected to the rest of the galaxy as the game begins. You might think this is to our advantage since it means we can't be attacked, but it also means we can't explore the galaxy and get anomalies. We also can't branch out and occupy systems which we can use to get little bits of extra resources which we may need because essentially we only have this one place from which to generate the resources we need to play the game including all the research and such. Normally you'd have plenty of planets with loads of building slots on them so you could build lots of research labs and administrative buildings and everything would be normal but with just a single place to build in, we do have to be a bit more sneaky and more careful, which is part of the challenge run. However, it's not quite as challenging as it looks because a birch world has better jobs than a normal planet. A birch world, by the way, is a essentially infinitely big planet thing that surrounds the supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy, and it will last forever and such, which is very handy. But the problem is, you can only build a certain number of things in a birch world in this mod based on what the population of it is. So while I can in theory put an infinite number of districts on the birch world, you can see on the left there right now I'm allowed to build zero districts so that sets me behind a little bit. What you have to do is I think it's every 100 population that gets added to the birch world, you're allowed to build one extra district. That's a pretty big restriction, but the districts are much better than the normal districts you get on planets. You can even make some late game resources from some of the earliest districts you can build. Although balancing the economy is a bit challenging because you need exotic things to upkeep some of these districts from the very beginning. It's going to be a bit of a juggling act. One that we don't have to do right now because until we have 100 population in our birch world, we can't build anything there. Although on the way there, we'll unlock some of the normal building slots, which we will be able to use. We're going to have issues with food right from the beginning because the districts you start with don't produce food. And as we increase our population, they'll want some food. We do have a couple of hydroponic farm building slots used. So if we micromanage the population's uh, worker assignments, we should be able to get those going and get a little bit of food. And we do have access to the galactic market, which we'll get to later. So for now, our goal is to just try and get as many people as possible so that we can essentially use the features of the birch world. We're going to be behind in population for pretty much the entire game because the way population works in this game very curiously is that it's just linear growth. So the population growth of your empire is directly correlated to how many planets you have. Therefore, by only having one, we have minimized our population growth right from the beginning. That means we need to do everything we can to increase our population growth modifiers 
so that we can get the absolute most out of the birch world that we can. To begin with, we're just going to send out a bunch of science ships and start exploring the little bit of the galaxy that's available to us. There's also an archaeology project available there. I won't really commentate on that because it's just another research project really that eventually unlocks one extra system if you complete it, part of the precursor event chain thing. So we sit around, unlock anomalies, research them later once it's a bit faster to do so, just claiming this area, and for any resource needs we have, we can actually come here to the market, and this market screen makes this quote-unquote challenge way easier than I expected. Because the birch world does produce a surplus of minerals, even right from the beginning. So we can just constantly sell them in this monthly trade system and buy anything that we need. And as long as the numbers always add up, we can use this to counterbalance the fact we're not going to be producing many things from the birch world. So that's handy. Plus, because we're not colonizing planets, which is the main thing that usually consumes minerals, we're going to have even more minerals than you're meant to have with the Birch World start. As for our traditions, we don't really need to focus on fighting or expansion ones, which are usually good ones to go for. So I'm going down the science tree to make our anomaly exploration go a bit better. I think we need to grab the plus 10% population one from the expansion chain, so I'm going to get that and probably ignore the rest for a bit. Essentially, we can do a non-standard build, but I'm not really going to talk about builds and that level of micromanagement in this series. We discover that we have a pet primitive species nearby, also in the core region. So that's nice, we can lord it over them, observe them, and later on perhaps try to do something with them in order to have them give us some stuff without us colonizing their planet and thus breaking the arbitrary rule I have put on this campaign. Here is the archaeology thing I mentioned going very slowly because our scientists suck, but it doesn't really matter, there's no rush because there's no particular gameplay advantage to finishing it in this case. But I have now finished, after some 13 years of research, the thing that connects us to the rest of the galaxy is a special project you have to do instead of a research, I should say. So that's great. Now we can send ships out to find some other players, some other empires. That's what we need to do to help build up my immigration plan because you need someone else to immigrate into your territory. So I'm going to absolutely spam out a bunch of science ships. We're going to very rapidly explore as much of the galaxy as possible in all possible directions to grab us some contacts and all of the various anomalies you encounter sometimes give you free resources and stuff so there's some material gain to exploring before anyone else does. We've got that repeatable blocker you can see there, found communities that I've done all three times which is the maximum number you can do it and that just increases your population growth in exchange for draining your food a bit faster but that's fine, we're well able to buy all the food we need, so we're going for that very handy. And now we start to meet some of the other factions. The first guys we meet are unfortunately an ancient empire. I don't think we can get immigration from an ancient empire, although I don't think I checked either. They're kind of handy though, it's just a very powerful player that's now going to be sitting right next to us and will probably just ignore us but will also block other people from coming towards us in that direction, so it's kind of nice to have them there. They're like the equivalent of a terrain feature in the galaxy in that now we can just ignore that direction for a bit until the late game when players start to actually catch up with the ancient empires. After this though, we do get a more useful contact. Some tentacly guys to our south start talking to us, and they seem like a relatively okay neighbour to have, no militarist xenophobes or something that are out to purge everybody. So there we go, now we have a regular neighbour that we can talk to. We have to send an envoy to them to build up our relations before we can do any immigration antics. But once I've done that, they offer me the deal and we can take it. So with that, it theoretically allows citizens to move between both empires, but realistically, they're going to come to me and that's because the birch world has absolutely loads of free space on it and loads of available jobs, which increases its immigration pull stat, which we can see in this tooltip here. So that's increased our population growth by about 50% right there. That's certainly going to make a big difference in the long run. And there's still more we can do because we can get more immigration packs. Plus, the other players probably don't have that many people yet. 
Once their planets start to get more and more overpopulated, they'll be streaming to our infinitely large birch world. And here you can see some signs that we are already close to discovering another faction with mysterious ships wandering around within our line of sight. We'll get straight onto that and try to talk them into coming to the birch world as well. It's a race of hydras that we discover next. And they also seem quite nice. And again, they are our neighbors to the north. So we're finding ourselves to be surrounded by factions that are very unlikely to attack us, which is great, although it does mean this series is actually going to be pretty chill, because we're not under any immediate threat. We're also a pacifist faction, so it's slightly harder for us to attack other people, plus with so much space around us we don't really need to. And we don't really want to invade the other factions because that would end up breaking our rules of having more than one planet. What I want is for them to be somewhat successful, but for me to be more economically successful so that we steal all of their citizens through open border treaties and immigration. Well, we'll see what we can do with that. Here was an annoying twist. Those ancients nearby tell me I'm not allowed to build next to them and kick me out of a system, not even refunding the influence points I had to spend to claim that system. And that's particularly annoying because this system has a ruined sentry array in it. That's a thing added by the Gigastructures mod, Gigastructural Engineering. It's a megastructure that once you repair it, gives you vision over the entire map at all times, which is pretty handy for seeing what's going on. You still need a tech to repair it, which we don't have, but it would have been great to have control of that. We can still build a new sentry array later, but it's much more expensive and comes much later in the game. While we might be pacifist, as I said, we still need to do some combat because we're going to have zero tolerance for all of the hazards in space, like the space amoebas and the mining factions, the automated enemies that are just around. Even though we are also a xenophilic faction, we're going to kill everything just because it's easier and also partially just to get some experience on an admiral and clear up some more routes through space to help us explore as well. That's a useful thing to do. So we're just going to have no mercy on that front. Now we can use the fact that we know other factions to help out with our economy. We can start using our surplus of minerals to trade for useful things like consumer goods which are difficult for us to manufacture because it takes building slots and we're only going to have a few of those for the entire game. So we don't want to waste them just making consumer goods and we won't even be able to make enough anyway. But as mentioned, this market screen is very overpowered for this campaign challenge. We can just keep selling things we don't need, which we do have quite a lot of, and buying everything we do. And as it happens, all the numbers do add up. It's perfectly plausible to get enough money to buy everything we need and keep the birch world churning along. At least for now, as more and more population shows up, we'll need to buy more and more food and more and more consumer goods. But some of those districts we can get later will also produce some. I don't remember the numbers, but it might still all add up. After a while, we get the Hydras to like us enough that we can get a migration treaty with them as well. And with their migration added in, now we've got a more serious buff. It's getting closer to 100% faster population growth. And again, that's going to increase with time with any luck. So while we only have one thing that's growing, it's growing as if we had two things, which maybe allows us to keep up with some of the lesser empires out there. We've still got further to go to truly keep up on the population count, but we don't necessarily need to because our population will be more productive being on the birch world. Anyway, we'll have to see. In the meantime, we keep sitting around, which is the main gameplay activity at the moment, just sort of speeding through things and occasionally stopping to do a tiny bit of micro, avoiding the annoying planetary micro that I really didn't like when I played this game before. We've researched gene clinics so we can throw that onto the birch world. I think it gives you plus 10% population growth or something, so again, that will help us out in the long run. Other than that, I'm mainly focusing on making research labs because it's our only way to get research. Other empires will have the edge on us in that regard, in that they could fill many planets with research labs. But some of the later districts we'll have will also generate research. And in this mod, we can use mega structures as well. The other thing I'm doing is just randomly claiming weird shapes, making an empire for myself out in the galaxy that I don't really intend to use, just because it's all you can do with the influence, really. And it seems like a good idea. Although it did occur to me that if I claim loads of systems with habitable planets, 
that means they can't be inhabited by the AI, which means it will be collectively more difficult for all of us to survive the extra big endgame crisis that I'm here to shepherd the galaxy through. So I don't know if this is a good idea, but I just kept doing it anyway. As for our ascension perks, the first one I took was just one that increases research speed. For the second one, I'm going to be taking one that increases our leader abilities. This is something I've been focusing on from the beginning. Our race is extra long lived. That means our leaders can be really high level because they don't die of old age. So by also augmenting that with faster experience gain and higher level caps, we can receive a variety of random passive buffs in the background for having really high level scientists and governors and leaders over time. Also by using text to increase the lifespan of our leaders, we can make that go even further if we want to. I'll be perfectly honest, I don't know what buffs having high level leaders and scientists actually gives you, but it's probably something good. That's what I'm banking on, and that's the level of analysis going into this build, of course. We eventually get invited to join the galactic community. Now we can get involved with what everyone else is doing. The thing I was curious to see is what is my diplomatic weight, which is a rough measure of how well you're doing in the game. And we're winning. I actually figured we might be in trouble, but this was the confirmation that the single birch world really can just compete with everything. We're actually doing especially well for tech, which is the thing I thought we wouldn't do very well at. We're definitely generating enough research to compete with everyone else, at this stage, at least. And because we have the most diplomatic weight, we can immediately enact some policies that will help us. There I threw my weight behind something that gives you even more weight for having good tech. Then, while looking around at other proposals, I noticed the Sustainability Initiative is here in the galaxy. This is the faction I played as in my previous Stellaris campaign that I made a narrative series about. You can probably find it somewhere. It's called For Them Forever if you haven't seen it. Anyway, because these guys are my babies, I decided to be nice to them. We're going to send an envoy and get good relations with them and try to get some of them to migrate to the Birch World as well. We do actually want to limit who migrates to the Birch World because it does cost influence to have them do it. So getting everybody into a migration pact wouldn't necessarily be the best thing, at least while we're still gathering influence to spend on territory. We discover another faction to our west. This is the first faction that we might actually need to pay attention to because they were xenophobic, but they're also isolationists. So with any luck, they'll just leave me alone and we don't have to worry about being invaded by the xenophobes. As mentioned, Everyone else we've met has actually been pretty nice. Nobody seems to dislike us. They are declaring war on each other, but none of them declare war on us. And I'm getting so rich, I'm just buying random things. We can't store all of our money somehow. So we have to just buy exotic resources, which will come in useful later. Overall, this entire campaign is going way better than I imagined it would, which in many ways is a shame because it's less interesting to talk about it. So we're going to be skipping over a lot in this series and trying to work our way through the odd interesting bit towards the part where we try to save the galaxy. While we do lack for military capacity, our ships are going to be quite good because of our decent tech. So already we have a fleet that can contest most stuff in the galaxy. And we're just going around killing all of the random hostile fleets out in the middle of nowhere to build experience and clear more gaps we can send science ships through on the off chance they discover something useful out there. All that good stuff. A bit later, the sustainability initiative become friendly enough that we can get that migration pact I wanted, so that's nice. Then on the way to go and look at how my immigration situation is going, I got this other message telling me that we've got this new contact. It's another bird race. So now there are two bird races, two peacock races specifically in the game. They're also called the Uva Zavani, which in my For Them Forever series was the main rival for a while of the sustainability initiative. And here they are again, back at it again, down at the bottom of the map. So we've got a situation here where there's now a good bird species, us, we're going to save the galaxy. And I like to imagine those bloodborne, as they call themselves, are probably out to cause some chaos in the galaxy. Well, we're going to have to try and be the bigger bird and come out on top of that one. All I need to do in the game now 
is fill out the borders I've roughly defined with those strands of territory you can see I've claimed up to other people's borders to define our big, mostly pointless and empty empire. Also there you can see me researching the first of the megastructure techs, so that's going to be moving us into the next era of this campaign where we're going to be able to build things in space to generate more resources. And because we already have quite a few resources, it's going to be relatively easy for us to get into the cycle of doing that. And in this fashion, even without owning any more planets, we can still generate all kinds of stuff, including things like research, which are harder to get for us in this campaign setup and will become very powerful. As mentioned, I have disabled the ability to make the military megastructures, so we can't make extremely powerful fleets, but we can make lots of resources with which to make normal fleets. And with any luck, we'll prepare sufficiently to save the galaxy. I've already played up until I think the year 2350, and nothing too significant happened during that time. There were a few odds and ends that I'd like to show you in the next part, but we'll try and get as far through the timeline as possible to, as I mentioned, try and get to something particularly interesting and with any luck, challenging, thus justifying the challenge run in some way, especially because the last time I played Stellaris, the end game challenge was really easy thanks to this mod. This time, the challenge should be much harder and our ways to deal with it are diminished. So we'll see what happens. Will we save the universe? Why don't you join me? for the future parts to find out.